a challenge to dignity. Our goal was to link academics, activists, and agencies concerned with the health of refugees and asylum seekers in a spirit of collaboration and comparison, bringing together professionals working with different populations of forcibly displaced peoples, ethnic groups, and nations. The video you are watching will contain all the presentations in one of five thematic sessions. We hope you find them to be of value. We're going to now move, uh, at least conceptually, to the Middle East, um, where we're going to learn about um, the lives of Iraqi women and their re reproductive vulnerabilities. The, our next speaker is Dr. Marcia Inhorn, and she's the William Landman Ch uh, Professor of Anthropology and International Affairs and Chair of the Council on Middle East Studies at Yale University. And um, we welcome um, Dr. Inhorn. Thank you. There we go. Um, hello, I'm so happy to be here, though, from afar. Um, and I really see so many friends on the Zoom here. I also just have to say, Farhana, that is incredible work that you're doing. It was extremely powerful, your presentation, and just you know, really Im impressive, the NGO that you've started with your husband, too. So thank you. That was one of the most powerful presentations I've heard in a long time. I'm actually going to be talking about men today more than women. Recording uh, in progress in my talk on America's war and Iraqi refugees' lives. And I want to begin with an argument, namely that America has failed in its moral duty to assist those whose lives it has destroyed through its own wars in the Middle East. Focusing on Iraq, I want to show how America's two wars there have had a shattering effect, not only for Iraqis who remain in the country, but also for those who have fled. In America today, few people connect the current Middle Eastern refugee crisis to the United States military interventions in Iraq. In the US, memories of the Iraq wars have faded and the Iraqi refugee crisis seems distant. So my main goal today is to rekindle this moribund history of these American wars and to link them directly to Iraqi refugee flight. And as a medical anthropologist, I've always been particularly concerned about the health costs of war in Iraq, not only for Iraqis who remained in the country, but also for those who have fled. And as I hope to show today, the health costs of conflict in Iraq include a toxic legacy literally carried in the bodies of exposed Iraqi refugees. And I want to illuminate the embodied dimensions of this human suffering. Although the U.S. has never been a particularly welcoming home for refugees from the Middle East, Iraqi refugees with such health problems face additional regimes of exclusion. Indeed, I argue that the U.S. has failed in its commitment to the lives of those Iraqis whose country and reproductive bodies it has destroyed. And so this is the main argument of my book, which is published in 2018 by Stanford University Press, called America's Era, Refugees, Vulnerability, and Health on the Margins. And it was published, you know, the, the I finished writing it, and it was published during the Trump regime. So I feel that it was particularly pertinent at that moment in American history. So throughout the 20th and 21st centuries, the Middle East has suffered a disproportionate number of wars and protracted conflicts that have led to population disruption and turmoil. Even before the fateful 2011 Arab uprisings that led to the Syrian government's war against its own people, 15 of 22 Arab League nations, comprising 85% of the region's overall population, had suffered from complex emergencies, including the country of Iraq. Indeed, it's fair to say that Iraq has lived through 40 years of perpetual war and human suffering. Saddam Hussein came to power in 1979 and soon plunged his country into a crippling eight-year war with neighboring Iran. The Iran-Iraq War led to the death of as many as one million soldiers and civilians. Then in 1990, Saddam Hussein invaded another neighboring country, Kuwait, which led to Operation Desert Storm, the US's first military intervention in that country. Lasting only seven months, the first Gulf War in Iraq nonetheless led to as many as 120,000 casualties, followed by 13 years of UN-imposed sanctions. In 1996, the United Nations implemented an oil for food program to prevent massive starvation in the country. But the sanctions continued to cripple the Iraqi economy until they were removed at the start of the second US-led war in Iraq. 
Responding to the September 11th attacks on the World Trade Center and Pentagon, and driven by a determination to eliminate Middle Eastern terrorism, the United States launched Operation Iraqi Freedom in 2003. We now know that the war was initiated upon false intelligence, purporting Saddam Hussein's links to September 11th and his threats to US national security through weapons of mass destruction. And I think this is highlighted again with Colin Powell's recent death. In retrospect, the second US-led war in Iraq is widely condemned as a US military and foreign policy failure of massive proportions, perhaps the worst in modern US and Middle Eastern history. The US military intervention in Iraq increased political instability in the country, leading to a power vacuum that was partly filled by Islamic insurgent groups, most notably ISIS. Furthermore, the US invasion of Iraq served as a crucial tipping point in an unstable sectarian balance of power, unleashing deep-seated sectarian tensions between Sunni and Shia Muslim factions in the country. And this brings us to the present moment. Although an end to the Iraq war has been declared twice, first by President George W. Bush in his mission accomplished speech on May 1st, 2003, and then on December 19th, 2011, 10 years ago by President Barack Obama, the truth is that the US military presence in Iraq has never ended. In 2016 alone, the US dropped a total of 12,095 bombs on Iraq in its battle against ISIS. At the beginning of 2020, nearly 1,000 additional US troops joined the 5,200 troops already on the ground in Iraq in response to Iraqi protesters, protesters who stormed the US embassy in Baghdad. As of today, there are 2,500 US troops in Iraq, although President Biden pledges to withdraw them by the end of the year. And one can only hope that the outcome of that withdrawal will not replicate the chaos of the US troop withdrawal from Afghanistan. Indeed, the inconvenient truth of both Iraq and Afghanistan, but one that few Americans seem to ponder, is that the United States has done more to produce and sustain deadly wars in the Middle East than to relieve them. Now, how has this ceaseless violence impacted the Iraqi people? The costs of war in Iraq have been acute, involving syndemics or synergistic epidemics of human suffering. In Iraq, war-related syndemics have involved thousands of civilian casualties and countless injuries, destruction of the healthcare infrastructure and flight of medically trained personnel, and physical and health problem and mental health problems of those who remain, some of which are due to war-related environmental contamination. And here I want to focus on the toxic legacy of war in Iraq, particularly the use of depleted uranium, or DU, a radioactive toxin that has been linked to a number of adverse health effects, including reproductive impairments. DU was used by US forces in both the first and second Gulf Wars. It is the waste product of the uranium enrichment process, and it's about 60% more radioactive than natural uranium. Like lead, nickel, and other heavy metals, DU is chemically toxic to humans. But it's been used since 1959 in the US munitions industry because it is 65% denser than lead, it has a high melting point, it has a tensile strength comparable to most steels, and it ignites when it fragments. The US military has called DU the silver bullet for destroying enemy tanks and the silver shield for armoring US tanks against enemy fire. However, when DU explodes, it creates a fine respirable sized dust that contaminates an impact site and presents a hazard to combat troops and civilians. This DU dust in the environment has a radioactive decay chain lasting 4.5 billion years, thereby, thereby posing very long-term health risks to exposed populations. So DU activists began to accuse the US Department of Defense of gross negligence in using a weapon in Iraq that, and I quote, distributes large quantities of toxic waste in areas where people live, work, grow food or draw water, unquote. The potential dangers of DU emerged as a social, political, and scientific issue after the first Gulf War. 
It's estimated that nearly 900,000 DU rounds were fired in Iraq by US and British troops in that war, with Gulf War veterans eventually attempting to link DU contamination to so-called Gulf War syndrome, a cluster of health problems, including among other things, both reproductive and sexual health impairments. In a 10-year follow-up study of American veterans who were hit by friendly fire and thus had DU shrapnel embedded in their bodies, researchers showed that higher than normal levels of uranium were associated with perturbations in reproductive hormones, causing male infertility and erectile dysfunction. Some evidence of neurological and genetic damage was also evident. With the ongoing use of DU in the 2003 Iraqi invasion, the World Health Organization finally released a report titled Potential Impact of Conflict on Health in Iraq, which suggested that DU might be related to reports of increased cancers, birth defects, reproductive health problems, and renal diseases in the Iraqi population. A series of studies later carried out in the heavily bombarded city of Fallujah which sustained some of the worst damage by US forces, show a syndemic of health-related problems, including high rates of congenital malformations, about 15% of all births, higher than expected rates of cancer, especially blood cancer, Recording stopped. leukemia and lymphoma in children, higher than expected rates of infant death when compared to infant mortality rates across the region, and an anomalous sex ratio in children under age five, suggesting that genetic damage was sustained Recording in, progress. in the zero to age four cohort. Hair samples taken from the parents of so-called Fallujah babies or Iraqi neonates with severe congenital malformations show the statistically significant presence of DU in their mother's bodies. Additional studies of DU exposure in Iraq demonstrate the substance's genotoxicity or ability to cause genetic damage even greater than previously thought. The chemical's carcinogenic or cancer-causing effects have led to an overall increase in breast, lung, thyroid, and blood cancers in Iraq, doubling or even tripling in incidence in some regions of the country. Of importance to US troops, inhalation and internalization of DU into the body has been shown to cause multiple health risks to U.S. veterans, especially those who performed as crews of damage tanks and rescue teams. Thus, the health costs of DU have affected American soldiers and Iraqi civilians alike. And so the synergism of these health-related effects can be seen in the story of Kamal, an Iraqi refugee I met in a reproductive health clinic in the state of Michigan. As I was to learn from Kamal, he had been conscripted into Saddam's army as a telecommunications specialist. I was always in a tank, always in a tank, he said, and I saw everything, the smells, the dead people. Eventually, Kamal joined the Iraqi resistance and made his way out of the country, but he was concerned about his relatives left behind in Iraq. He explained to me, we heard that there is uranium everywhere. You know, Marsha, cancer, a lot of people in Iraq got cancer. If you ask anybody here, you got the flu, or now it would be COVID, <laughs> the question there would be, you got cancer? Before it was not easy to use the term saratan, which is Arabic for cancer, but now it's e easy to say, I got cancer. My sister, she had a 16 year old daughter. She died after two months from cancer, liver cancer. She found out and then she died. By the time I met Kamal in Detroit, Michigan, he had a happy story to tell. In the 10 years since he had arrived in America, Kamal was able to accomplish many of the things in life that other Iraqi refugees could only dream of. These included a happy marriage to his Iraqi sweetheart, whom he had met in a refugee camp, American citizenship by way of naturalization, an economically stable life as the proprietor of two small barber shops, ownership of two fixer upper homes that he and his two Iraqi refugee brothers had remodeled, and the joys of parenthood through the birth of a baby. Pulling a photo from his wallet, Kamal smiled widely when he showed me the picture of his little Haider, his 13-month-old son. As he pointed out proudly, Haider was an American by birth, not born in exile, in a land that they now called home. However, as Kamal confessed to me, Haider's birth was exceptional because Kamal suffered from a serious male infertility problem that could only be overcome through costly assisted reproductive technologies. Male infertility, he explained, was common in Iraq and among his refugee community in Michigan, a situation that he linked to war-related environmental exposure. And he said, 
Marsha, I want to tell you something about me. I have no problem with sex, no problem with my body. I don't smoke, no drinking. I do exercise every day and I'm healthy. But I know a lot of Iraqi men like me, they don't have kids and they take a long time to get a baby. I know about 15 to 20 people like that here in Michigan. Some are friends of mine. We are all refugees, all of us Iraqi refugees, the same life we live, the same war, the same camp, the same thing. And we began talking about the subject of not getting babies. I always tell them, we don't want to be shy about this because we need a baby. Don't be shy. Go to the doctor. Don't stay at home. Tell him, the doctor, I'm sick and I need to take medicine. I know somebody with male infertility and he was ready to make a divorce with his wife and he's young. But I tell him, please don't do that. Go to the doctor. Do something. In Iraq, we lost all our good doctors, but here in America, everything is good. The doctor is good. Technology is good. Medicine is good. But some men, they're embarrassed to say, I have this problem. It's the rujula, the manhood, but this is wrong. As Kamal explained, many Iraqi refugee men feared that their reproductive health problems were somehow due to irremediable war-related exposures and traumas. Not surprisingly, Al-Harb, the war, figured prominently in Iraqi refugee men's narratives, given that some men had been combatants while others had suffered torture and imprisonment in their home country. To that end, they felt grateful to have escaped alive, although life in America was not easy as their stories revealed. And so I collected such narratives of suffering and reproductive disruption over a five-year period of ethnographic fieldwork with nearly 100 resettled Arab refugees in Dearborn, Michigan, an ethnic enclave community on the margins of Detroit, which is considered to be the capital of Arab America. The arrival of Iraqi refugees to the Detroit area is not surprising, given that Metro Detroit has been one of North America's largest Middle Eastern refugee receiving grounds. Beginning in the 1950s, exiled Palestinians started resettling in the Detroit suburbs, a pattern that continued among Palestinians over the five ensuing decades. By the 1970s, Palestinians were joined by Lebanese, whose numbers swelled with each passing year of the Lebanese Civil War. By the mid-1990s, Lebanese and Palestinians were joined by Iraqis, tens of thousands of whom came as refugees in the aftermath of the First Gulf War. Thus, over half a century, metropolitan Detroit absorbed three major populations of fleeing Arabs, Palestinians, then Lebanese, then Iraqis. By 2000, Michigan scholars dubbed the city's new ethnic enclave Arab Detroit, highlighting the importance of a quarter million people of Arab descent now living in the area. However, in 2008, the same year as the Great Recession, the Iraqi population of Arab Detroit began to swell as the second wave of refugees began to receive admission into the US. As shown in this table, Iraqi refugee admissions in 2008 increased eightfold over 2007. By 2009, fully one quarter of all refugees entering the United States were Iraqis, and Arab Detroit absorbed nearly as many as the cities of New York, Chicago, and Los Angeles combined. By 2014, Iraqis represented 28% of the refugees entering the US, the single largest group. So this table is from 27, 2007 to 2015, 126,000 Iraqi refugees entered the US. This is fully one fifth of all refugees admitted, but less than one half of the Iraqis seeking US refugee assistance. And as seen in this table, Iraqis were resettled in every single U.S. state except Wyoming, the home of former Vice President Dick Cheney. <laughs> and if you go to level one, the states that supported the most Iraqis, you can see your state of California was number one, particularly uh, El Cajon, which is the Iraqi hub of California. But Michigan was the second most generous state, followed by Texas. Yet, the local Michigan economy is poorly suited for large-scale Iraqi refugee resettlement, particularly the city of Detroit, where most of these refugees were placed. Detroit is America's poorest big city, with 38% of its population, roughly two-fifths, living below the federal poverty line. Two-thirds of Detroiters live in a state of Alice, asset-limited, income-constrained, although employed, basically the working poor. These poverty figures are replicated in Arab Detroit's refugee community. Fully four-fifths, or 82%, 
of all Iraqi Muslim refugee families live on household incomes of less than $30,000 per year. And nearly half, 42%, live well below the U.S. federal poverty line on household incomes of less than $10,000 per year. Astonishingly low. So given these poverty statistics, it's not surprising that most of the Iraqi refugees I met in Iraq, Detroit, were precariously employed and often desperately poor. Many of the men did not speak English fluently, nor did their wives, as few had attended school in the United States and few had gone beyond high school in their home country. Without strong English skills or advanced educations, most of the Iraqi refugee men in my study were employable only in low wage, blue collar or service sector occupations, mainly as gas station attendants, dishwashers and busboys in Middle Eastern restaurants, truck drivers, construction workers, auto mechanics, and occasionally factory workers. But in you know, 2008 and thereafter, the Michigan auto industry took a real dive, and so it was hard to get factory work. Salaries and wages were generally low, with many men and their wives living in small apartments and generally eking out subsistence lives below the poverty line. Now, without, re without regular employment, most did not have private health insurance to cover costs of their medical care. Most did not own credit cards, and as a result, virtually all of their financial transactions, including visits to medical clinics, were handled in cash. In cases of medical emergency, social safety nets were generally missing, forcing some participants in my study to rely on local Islamic charities for relief. And I'm almost done. Um, but I met all of these men and women who were suffering from problems of infertility with male infertility of the kind faced by Kamal, the most frequent diagnosis. Like Kamal, all of the men and women in my study were dreaming of becoming parents, not only to achieve cultural mandates of adult personhood, but to make new lives and new families after all that had been lost. However, unlike Kamal, few of these men and women could afford the $150 office visit, let alone a $12,000 cycle of in vitro fertilization. And so Kamal was the only person in my study who was able to self-finance three costly rounds of this thing, which is called intracytoplasmic sperm injection, a variant of IVF designed specifically to overcome male infertility. Kamal was at the end of the day, one of only two men in my study who were able to father an ICSI or IVF child. So by the end of my study, I came to think of this, these poor struggling infertile refugees as reproductive exiles. Banished from their home country by war, most remained in a kind of double exile, unable to return to Iraq because of ongoing violence and a shattered healthcare system, but unable to access infertility services in the most expensive country in the world in which to make an IVF baby. Living constrained lives on the margins of Detroit, there was little that they could do to change their situations. They were reproductive exiles, impoverished, immobile, and barren, but exiled from a costly American healthcare system in which access to affordable IVF was impossible. So ultimately, I wanna again argue that the United States has never been a particularly welcoming home for refugees from the Middle East. And we certainly see this in the plight of infertile Iraqi refugees. Their reproductive bodies have been made toxic from US military intervention but they are unable to seek recompense and recovery in the US healthcare system. Such regimes of exclusion make crystal clear the lack of US commitment to the lives of Iraqi refugees whose country it has partially destroyed. And we now see their lives of barren reproductive exile as they try to make a living in America. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was um, very, um, tragic um, and um, sobering. Um, we only have time for one question. Is there um, anyone in, who's physically here in the room that would like to make a question or a comment? Okay, there is one uh, a comment online. I'll just uh, read it. Can you talk about how Kamal's experience with infertility and seeking treatment was similar or different to less well-off Iraqis refugees in Detroit? Those may be less equipped to obtain assistance in their quest to have a child. Also, I'm curious if you have done research with American service members who are experiencing similar difficulties with fertility. That's from Dr. Seth Hanna. Hi, Dr. Seth Hanna. It's so nice to see you out there. Um, yeah, I mean, Kamal, I 
sort of include his story here just because it had all the elements of the infertility, the cancer, the exposure to DU, the fight, you know, being a soldier in Iraq. He sort of brought all those issues to the fore. But I, you know, as I said, he was unusual. He was really one of two people out of everybody that I met that was able to make a baby. And it was a tragic story. I mean, I thank you for that term tragic. It is an American tragedy um, in a way. You know, America caused a tragedy in Iraq. And then, you know, the tragedy of people coming here and not being able to have the children that they really, really, really want. And so most of the rest of the refugees I met were really struggling to pay the office visit. You know, it was cash because they didn't have any other way of paying. IVF in the United States is almost always private. You know, people pay, it's a cost for, you know, you have to pay. It's private medicine and it's very expensive. And so very, very few people were able to, to do those technologies, even though in this particular Arab serving IVF clinic where I worked, you know, there was a doctor who was humane and tried to give people generous discounts and it still was thousands of dollars, which people couldn't come up with. So, you know, like many underrepresented minority groups in America, we see that there are real reproductive justice and access issues here. And we just honestly still don't have good scholarship in America on the infertility problems of minority populations, you know, including Middle Eastern, various Middle Eastern and refugee populations in this country. So I would say much more research needs to be done on what the reproductive effects are. Nobody that I know of has done any kind of ethnographic work on the reproductive health problems of American US service people, but there is an excellent book about UK Gulf War veterans by an anthropologist in the UK. Um, and the book is titled uh, entitled um, Impotent Warriors. Um, it's, it's called Impotent Warriors, and it's about men with Gulf War Syndrome, UK British soldiers who are suffering from sexual and reproductive health problems. And so, yes, um, that's the one thing I can point you to. There's also, as you may know, Aaron Finley, another uh, a medical anthropologist, has did a very profound ethnography of American soldiers returning from Iraq and Afghanistan with PTSD and mental health issues. So there's been some work on... Thank you. So thank you very much. I'm sorry, we need to move on. Um, our next speaker is uh, Dr. Morgan Chalmers. She is an MD PhD candidate in psychological and medical anthropology here at UC San Diego. Recording in and progress. Her dissertation is exploring reproductive decision making and access to care among Syrian refugees in Jordan. So thank you very much for joining us. Um, So to begin, I want to uh, thank my advisor, Dr. Shortish, for the opportunity to speak here today. In my talk, I hope to specifically highlight things that I've learned during my research with Syrian communities in San Diego and Jordan that will have relevance to researchers and providers beyond these specific settings. So my project began as a broad exploration of reproductive health after displacement among Syrian refugees in two very different field sites here in San Diego, California, where over 1,200 Syrians have been resettled, and in Jordan, which currently serves as a site of first asylum for more than half a million Syrian refugees. Although I framed my project as a comparative study between two distinct nodes of the refugee resettlement process, it's important to remember that only a small percentage of refugees living in so-called countries of first asylum, such as Jordan, Lebanon, and Turkey, will actually be offered the opportunity to be formally resettled abroad through the United Nations. Nevertheless, I find the comparative framework useful in that it challenges the tendency to treat refugees as a homogenous population, and instead illuminates the contextually specific barriers faced by the particular populations that I work with at each field site. Today, I will use a socio-ecological framework to discuss the ways in which reproductive health after displacement is shaped by structural contexts, shared experience, experiences amongst particular populations, and individual level factors. Before beginning, I want to give an overview of my methodological approach. So I spent 14 months conducting ethnography and qualitative interviews in San Diego. And then in September, 2019, I began my current ongoing field work with refugees living outside of camps in Jordan, where I have been living thus far for nearly 26 consecutive months. I've been especially lucky that many of the Syrian families I initially worked with put me in contact with their relatives currently residing in Jordan. 
So although I'm conducting research at two different sites, many participants in both locations belong to the same extended family networks, which has allowed me to establish longstanding relationships of trust and friendship with families in both locations. This dynamic has also offered unique insights and opportunities for comparative ethnography. My methods include person-centered interviewing and ethnographic participant observation, both of which remain relatively underutilized in the field of uh, refugee studies and specifically studies of refugee health, although they offer unique advantages for the, for the study of these topics. Person-centered interviews are conducted in series over time with a single research participant and differ from the semi-structured interviews typically used in public health research in several significant ways. First, person-centered methodologies adopt an analytical framework that views the narratives recounted by the interview participants as co-constructed by both the researcher and the interviewee. In contrast, studies employing semi-structured qualitative interviews usually treat interviewees' responses as objective reflections of that individual's opinion and perspective, or alternatively, as neutral descriptions of sociocultural norms, values, or beliefs shared by a community the interviewee belongs to. The impact of the researcher's presence on the responses provided by an interviewee is typically not considered during data analysis. Conversely, person-centered approaches do not view an interviewee's responses as a neutral reflection of some internal or external reality. Rather, responses are understood to be actively constructed narratives. Both the form and content of these narratives are influenced by numerous factors, including the respondent's mood, recent events, the interview setting, or even the language in which the interview is conducted. For example, different aspects of identity and morality are organized around and evoked by the use of each of the two or more languages the respondent uses. Person-centered interviews are conducted with the same respondent over time in order to allow researchers to observe shifts and inconsistencies that may occur in the way the interviewee constructs their responses. When inconsistencies are observed, it's not because the interviewee is, to put it crudely, lying or intentionally deceiving the researcher, but rather the presence of narrative inconsistencies reflects a fundamental shared aspect of the human experience and that the stories we tell ourselves and others about who we are are constantly being rewritten and transformed by our daily life experiences in ways that are sometimes subtle and sometimes dramatic. Person-centered approaches that allow researchers to attend the dynamics of the interview that are important in any context, but especially critical to understand when conducting research with displaced populations. Although many studies in refugee health are conducted via interpreters or members of the research team who speak the participants' language, relatively few studies adequately consider how the identity of the interviewer and or the interpreter may influence the responses given. <clears throat> For instance, when re researching adolescents' use of contraception in a community where premarital, premarital sex is socially unacceptable, participants might be more reluctant to disclose their own experiences engaging in premarital sex if interviews are conducted through an interpreter from the same community. Furthermore, conducting interviews over time illuminates narrative shifts and inconsistencies that may reflect transformations in the way an interviewee positions himself in relation to the social norms and cultural values of both the host society and the country of origin. Such transformations are rarely unidirectional, unidirectional but rather a complex, constant process of negotiating with and redefining one's own identity, values, and beliefs in relation to multiple contrasting normative models of, for example, what it means to be a successful woman or a good mother or what an ideal family looks like. In addition to person-centered interviews, I employed the classic anthropological method of participant observation, which is generally defined as taking part in the daily lives of research participants to the fullest extent possible over an extended period of time. Much of my participant observation took place in clinical and humanitarian settings where I interacted not only with refugee women, but also with those providing them with medical care, social services, and workshops designed to promote refugee women's health broadly defined. In San Diego, I accompanied research participants as they attended family events, prenatal appointments, and even gave birth. <clears throat> in Jordan, the coronavirus pandemic has limited opportunities for this type of participant observation although I hope to resume clinical ethnography in Jordan this year. <clears throat> Though the pandemic limited my in-person research, the lockdown offered opportunities for a different type of participant observation 
as a volunteer with several local NGOs who conduct research on reproductive health among Syrian refugees in Jordan. While working remotely, I analyzed qualitative interview transcripts, drafted reports, and attended meetings with international research partners. This unexpected opportunity offered in-depth insights into the processes through which knowledge about Syrian refugees is produced within the larger structures of the humanitarian research economy. <coughs> I took a COVID test yesterday for my flight. It's negative, don't worry. Practically speaking, Participant observation has to offer has much to offer health disparities research because it allows the ethnography to capture the mundane aspects of everyday life that are often taken for granted and may remain unmentioned during qualitative interviews. For instance, when I first began clinical ethnography in San Diego, I was struck by the difficulty of navigating the US healthcare system with limited English proficiency. The smallest tasks were immensely complicated by language barriers such as figuring out where to park and how to pay for parking at a med major medical center, finding the correct building and checking in at reception. Yet despite the fact that communication barriers seem to complicate every step of the process, during interviews, women almost never mentioned language barriers as a challenge they face when seeking healthcare. Perhaps because they face these same difficulties nearly every day, whether they were going to the grocery store or attending a parent-teacher conference. As such, participant observation was an essential part of my methods and allowed me to gain additional insights into the larger context discussed by interviewees at my field sites, which I will describe briefly now. San Diego is home to approximately 1,300 Syrian refugees, the vast majority of whom were resettled in the US in 2016 and thus have been living in San Diego for about two years at the time which I began my field work. In Jordan, 80% of refugees live outside of official UN refugee camps, mainly in the governance of Mafraq, Amman, and Erbid. <clears throat> Over half a million Syrians are official, officially registered as asylum seekers with the UNHCR. However, the actual number is estimated to be much higher, at least over 1 million. Life for unregistered refugees in Jordan is extremely difficult and documentation, documentation status is one of the social determinants of health that I will now discuss. <laughs> I will use a socio-ecological framework to categorize and compare factors that shape reproductive experience at four levels, the individual, interpersonal, institutional, and systemic. For the sake of time, I have chosen to discuss one or two factors at each level in detail, focusing specifically on those that have received relatively less attention in the literature, but I'm happy to discuss others during the Q&A. Hmm. Individuals who are not registered as official asylum seekers with the UN face extreme hardship compared to re registered refugees. Families who are unregistered are ineligible for cash assistance, food coupons, government subsidized healthcare or other services provided by the humanitarian sector, and their children are usually un un unable to attend school. In addition, unregistered refugees often live in fear of being deported back to their country of origin. Refugees who entered Jordan after 2012 via official border crossings were transported to Zatari and later Azraq refugee camp, where they were registered with the UN as asylum seekers. After arriving in the camp, the only way to leave was to be sponsored by a Jordanian citizen or to sneak out through extra legal channels and risk deportation if caught. Despite these risks, over 1,600 Six, I'm sorry, 160,000 Syrians are estimated to have fled the harsh living conditions in Zatari camp without authorization, effectively voiding their registration. Refugees who entered Jordan outside of the official border crossing were able to present themselves to UN offices and request asylum without penalty during the early years of the war. However, some avoided registering with the UN for fear that it might compromise their ability to return to Syria if such data fell into the hands of the Syrian government, giving that registering with the UNHCR as a refugee was tantamount to publicly taking sides, something that many Syrians did not wish to do. Although Syrian refugees <coughs> are often <coughs> treated as a homogenous category, Syria is an exceptionally diverse country and regional differences are often relevant to understanding health and health behaviors. For example, the majority of Syrian refugees in Jordan came from the province of Dara, which is located on the border between the two countries. Cross-border net networks of trade and kinship 
predate the drawing of the border in 1916 and remain active today. These strong cross-border relationships are a significant, a significant resilience promoting factor for some refugees arriving from Dara, particularly those residing outside of camps in the northern regions of Erbard and Ramtha. Regional differences are especially important in relation to two aspects of reproductive health that have been a central focus of the humanitarian response in Jordan, namely early marriage and fertility rates among Syrian refugees. Nevertheless, few studies adequately account for regional differences in explaining these phenomena. For example, although most sources suggest rates of early marriage among Syrians have increased since their displacement, <clears throat> Uh, these studies rely on national level data sets from pre-conflict Syria and do not account for the significant differences in rates of early marriage that exist between Syria's various governance. In fact, a recent insightful study by Sieverding et al. argues that rates of early marriage have remained largely unchanged for the specific populations of Syrians living in Jordan, most of whom migrated from regions with rates of early marriage that were already much higher than Syria's national average. The authors conclude that even if displacement has not statistically increased the practice of early marriage, it has led to a qualitative shift in the drivers of early marriage within a context in which young women, married and unmarried, experience new forms of vulnerability unique to the setting of displacement and, at the same time, often lack the same sources of social support that were available to them in pre-conflict Syria. At both my field sites in San Diego and Jordan, I was struck by how frequently providers, humanitarian staff, and even the general public referenced what they saw as the problem of high fertility among Syrian refugees. Early in my research, I encountered this figure, which offers a dramatic visual, visual representation of the difference between the fertility rates of Jordanians and Syrians living in Jordan, 2.6 and 4.7 respectively. I sought to understand whether this difference reflected pre-conflict fertility preferences access barriers in Jordan or other factors associated with displacement. <clears throat> Superficial comparisons with national level data from 2010 suggest that fertility rates have increased since displacement. However, as we saw with early marriage, such comparisons do not account for regional differences in fertility preferences. Although I could not locate data on total fertility dates total fertility rates at the government level, I used data from the 2006 Multiple Cluster Indicator Survey to compare rates of contraceptive use across governance and found that 57% of reproductive aged married women in Dara were not using contraception at the time of the survey, compared to 41.7% of those surveyed nationally. Next, I looked at unmet need for contraception and I found that 21% of respondents in Dara desired to space their births or limit their family size, but we're not using contraception at the time of the survey. Finally, working backwards, I calculated the percentage of those surveys surveyed who were not using contraception and did not desire to limit family size or space their births at the time of the survey, which was 36.1. These data suggest that access barriers resulting in unmet need contributed to low rates of contraceptive use in Dara. However, access barriers do not account for the 36% of respondents who were not using and did not desire to use contraception, suggesting that a preference for large families may also play a role. <coughs> These are only several of many individual level factors that shape reproductive experience after displacement. Social determinants of reproductive health at the interpersonal level include providers' attitudes and prior experiences, factors associated with a patient's relationships, not only with her spouse, but also with her extended family um, and her spouse's ex extended family, the availability of supportive social networks, um, the climate potentially of Islamophobia and or anti-refugee sentiment, and the presence of culturally, ethnically, and or linguistically similar immigrant communities. I find this final factor particularly interesting as it can affect displaced individuals' experiences of reproductive health in both positive and negative ways. For example, refugees who are resettled in communities of similar ethnic, cultural, or linguistic background may benefit immensely from their neighbors' collective knowledge and guidance as they adapt to the new environment. However, researchers have also highlighted the ways in which on a structural level, residents in so-called ethnic enclaves can also have negative effects on health due to the quote, concentration of poverty, 
lack of resources, and exposure to environmental risk factors. On an interpersonal level, relations between existing immigrant communities and newly arrived refugees are not necessarily supportive and in some cases may contribute to an unwelcoming or even hostile environment in healthcare settings. For example, while San Diego's Iraqi community has mobilized to support Syrian arrivals in a number of significant ways, some healthcare staff and providers also express their resentment of what they described as Syrian's refusal to assimilate to American social norms in the same way that Iraqis had. <clears throat> in Jordan, which hosts large populations of Iraqi, Somali, Sudanese, and Yemeni refugees, humanitarian and health service providers are often understandably frustrated with the disproportionate amount of aid and services earmarked specifically for Syrian refugees, while refugees of other nationalities receive significantly less report, support. In this context, Syrian refugees are sometimes stereotyped as entitled in comparison to other refugee populations and seen as taking advantage of subsidized services. One provider example, one provider, for example, remarked that Syrians, more than any other nationally, nationality, come to the clinic, quote, just for fun, because it's free for them. <clears throat> Among the many factors that shape reproductive health at the institutional level, relatively little has been written about how refugees experience the bureaucratic structure. Two minutes? Okay of the US healthcare system. The researchers often focus on how culture shapes refugees' health behaviors, the organizational culture of healthcare provision in the US is equally deserving of analysis. The highly regimented, uh, strict this highly regimented strict schedule that structures healthcare provision is statistically speaking far more anomalous than the quote polyphonic orientation to time that is found in most societies worldwide. Patients who arrive late to appointments may be, may be treated rudely by clinical staff and are forced to reschedule as a way of, quote, teaching them to be on time, even when reasonable accommodations could have been made. For example, when I accompanied a San Diego participant to her first trimester ultrasound and she requested a female ultrasound technician, we were told by the receptionist that, quote, if she wanted to make special requests, she should have arrived on time. Ironically, we had checked in at 2.44. 243, two minutes prior to her 245 appointment time, which was clearly written on her appointment reminder card, which she showed to the receptionist. Apparently, the receptionist had previously explained over the phone that it was necessary to arrive 30 minutes prior to the appointment to prepare for the ultrasound. However, the explanation had been in English and she had not taken the time to set up interpretation for the appointment reminder call. Obviously, late arrivals cannot always be accommodated. Nevertheless, if we make accommodations when possible <clears throat> and stop treating patients who arrive late as if, they are as if they are less deserving of respectful care, we could significantly reduce the barriers of refugees and other patients face when seeking care with very little effort. <clears throat> Numerous structural factors may impact refugees' reproductive health. These range from a political climate to material infrastructure to immigration policy. A recent study conducted by Doctors Without Borders suggested that stricter immigration policies may lead to higher rates of violence for refugees who enter the country via extra legal channels. The same study found that more than half of the incidents of violence reported by migrants were perpetuated by European state authorities, including police and border control. These authors conclude that exclusionary policies designed to reduce migrants' ability to reach and seek asylum in European nations ultimately increase migrants' risk of exposure to physical or sexual violence, and they urge policymakers to consider how immigration restrictions further exacerbate this population's vulnerability to exploitation and abuse. <clears throat> so in my talk today, I have briefly discussed only some of the factors that shape reproductive experience after displacement. I'm happy to answer questions about these or any other aspects of reproductive health um, during the question and answer session. Thank you. Could somebody get um, Dr. Chalmers some water? That would be great. Yes. Um, and um, are there any questions or comments from the room? We have about um, three minutes. Um, yes, um, Tala. Morgan, first, I want to commend you for your courage, for your work in Jordan, <clears throat> and for all the great work that you're doing, really. Um, it takes such courage to work in that part of the world and you are doing it so we're very very proud of you so morgan my question for you um having worked with families in jordan and you know those are either the same or extended families here in san diego can you tell us about um 
or some ideas on what can we learn in the U.S. from the Jordanian experience when it comes to uh, dealing with refugees in the healthcare system. What can we learn like from the U.S. implemented in Jordan? No, here in the U.S. What can we learn oh, okay. from Jordan's response to refugees? Um, I think it's a good question. Um, I think, I mean, just thinking about the healthcare system more broadly and kind of like the dynamics of the clinical, clinical interaction in Jordan compared to the US, it's very different. I think your question kind of gets back to the point I touched on at the end concerning kind of like bureaucracies and, you know, scheduling and like all of the like extra steps you have to do um, in the US just to like submit your insurance documentation before your appointment, like 48 hours before, I think just thinking about, I mean, I mean, even personally, as a person who seeks healthcare services in the U.S. and in Jordan, it's so much easier for me to get healthcare in Jordan. It's so much easier. Like I've had so many just getting normal. And as someone who's like intimately familiar with the medical system here, I think we could learn a lot looking at how just very basic services are much more accessible at a, at a much lower cost in countries like Jordan. Um, whereas people here are like, even to get something relatively simple, like a lot of the time they just won't go to the doctor because they don't want to have to face the, the many, many barriers of how to make the appointment and how to submit the documents. And, you know, it's just, I mean, even like things like figuring out how to park and where do you go to the machine to pay for the parking? A lot of people haven't had to do that before. So I think just like the, the ease of getting basic services in Jordan is better than it is in the U.S. and it shouldn't be that way. Thank you. Um, Dr. Shardash has a question. And it has to do with the the people that you're working with, you met people in Jordan through people in Syria. And so in, in some respects, you're not doing a transnational comparison of two separate groups, but you're doing an ethnography that's a transnational ethnography of, of a single extended community. Can you say a little bit more about what, what that's like and, and the, um, the extent to which this really is one uh, transnational group and how they interact with one another and how often and, and in what detail they interact with one another. Sure. So, I mean, I think practically speaking, what it's like is every time I go back and forth between Jordan and the U.S., I have two big suitcases that are like full to the brim with stuff to bring back and forth. Um, like I have to bring a lot of the families here. They've finally, after a few years, been able to like they're a little bit better off financially. So I'm bringing like 10 laptops into Jordan this trip back. And it's like I'm trying to figure out how to get through customs without having to pay fines on these and stuff. So I think just like the, the way people maintain their connections um, through WhatsApp and through also like finding, there's a lot of connections between Jordan and San Diego. Like everyone almost always knows someone who knows someone who knows someone who's going back and forth. So people will send stuff. They'll send even food, like homemade food. Like they make shatta and they have me bring the shatta with them. So it's like a, like a hot sauce. Um, but yeah, I think people are, are particularly excited that after they get their citizenship, after they've been here for five years, they may be able to save up and travel back to the Middle East and also be able to potentially um, put in like a, um, like a family reunification request in order to bring family members here. So that's a, a big part of my ethnography, mm -hmm. looking at that. Right. Okay, thank you very much. That was a very interesting presentation. Um, our next speaker is uh, Dr. Maiza Hamza. She uh, has a doctor in education. She's a clinical psychologist and an instructor of Stepping Stones to Success, uh, which is a program at Stanford. She's also a visiting professor in the Department of Public Health Sciences at UC Davis School of Medicine. And she's going to be speaking to us about Arab refugees' attitudes and behaviors around domestic violence. Okay, welcome to my presentation. Um, I'll be talking about uh, Arab refugee attitudes and behaviors towards domestic violence. Uh, so worldwide, around 1 billion women report lifetime domestic violence. Can you hear me? Too? Okay, great. Okay. In vulnerable Arab refugee women, uh, already traumatized by wars, sectarian violence, oppression, the impacts of domestic violence is even more devastating. And it's overlooked, unfortunately. 
Okay, research on post resettlement domestic violence and Arab refugee communities has focused more on uh, documenting magnitude of domestic violence and less on how pre resettlement attitudes and behaviors towards domestic violence may change post resettlement due to gender acculturation. And it appears that under like unemployment or underemployment and the poverty and um, the anger of Arab refugee men um, carry the burden to the family and contributes to all this violence. All the difficulties and the obstacles the refugees are facing. So despite the negative mental consequences of being in a violent and abusive relationship, um, such as depression, anxiety, post-traumatic stress disorder, and suicidal thoughts, uh, Arab refugee women uh, feel that they have no choice but to stay in an abusive relationship because often the man is the breadwinner and they're worried about uh, like financial consequences of leaving the abusive relationship and taking care of the children and that loss of income. So they just stay. And um, as an immigrant woman from the Middle East, I know this is the case that unfortunately an Arab women stay, especially the ones who are not educated and don't work. They just stay in the abusive relationship unfortunately. Okay, so I'm the principal investigator for this study. And uh, I have co-investigator Dr. Hadir Akram al -Ani. He's from Iraq. Dr. Al Naima from Egypt. And um, Dr. Kuga, uh, who is the supervisor at the public health clinic in uh, UC Davis Medical School. So we did the pilot study in three stages and we did it in Northern California and the San Francisco Bay area where I practice and the greater Sacramento metropolitan area. So stage one in 2018, we did the literature review on the relationship between refugee acculturation and the attitudes and behaviors towards domestic violence. And uh, we used the instruments to uh, design to evaluate attitudes and behaviors towards domestic violence. The stage three in 2019, we adopted the attitudes about intimate partner violence against women, uh, ATT IPV scale to produce our attitudes and behaviors towards domestic violence. And it was tran uh, translated in Arabic and culturally validated. It was a 50 item instrument, 24 questions on attitude, 26 questions on behaviors. So during 2020, 2021, we surveyed 100 female and male Arab refugee participants from Iraq, Egypt, Yemen, Lebanon, Palestine, and Syria. And we analyzed the data. So our hypothesis was, that acculturation would decrease domestic violence approval in Arab women, but not so much in men. And in terms of behaviors, our hypothesis was that domestic violence approval would decrease in men due to fear of legal consequences like prosecution and jail, but would not decrease much in women due to fear of divorce and fear of community exclusion if they reported their husband. So the results in terms of attitudes in women, acculturation was too weak because of poor English, unemployment, separation from mainstream society. It was too weak to decrease domestic violence approval. In men, domestic violence approval increased with the number of post resettlement years, perhaps to shame, due to shame or anger or disempowerment. In terms of behaviors, in women, domestic violence approval has not decreased um, because of following reporting, a husband prosecution, divorce. But in men, domestic violence approval has not decreased, probably due to chronic um, underemployment, frustration, shame, 
and poor anger management. So and for sociodemographic data, um, we interviewed 60 males and 69% um, were Sunni Islam and 35% um, had good conversation reading and writing in terms of the fluency of English language. In terms of education, 42% had secondary education and 27% were drivers. That was their occupation in the home country. And 76% were working in the US and 93% uh, were renting an apartment. 85% uh, had driver's license and 88% uh, drove to medical appointments, school, grocery shopping. And 38% had two cars in the household. And 87% uh, experienced extreme uh, hardship in their ancestors in the home country. 92% lost family member due to war or violence. And 97% were in refugee camps before the coming to the US. And 23% were from Yemen. The mean age was 41. Number of children mean was four. Years of living in the US was five. Number of people at home were five. And the income was 75,000. And I'll speak about the um, income at the end. So the predictors of attitudes towards domestic violence. So domestic violence predictors for males, the number of years living in the US was the highest risk factor for approving domestic violence, followed by their education level. Participants from Syria and Egypt showed a higher disapproval of domestic violence compared to those from Yemen and other countries. Muslim Sunnis showed a higher disapproval of domestic violence compared to Muslim, Shia, and other religions. In terms of females, domestic violence predictors for females, being from Iraq was the highest risk factor for approving domestic violence, followed by being from Syria, compared to participants from Yemen and other countries. In terms of behaviors, Predictors for males, a domestic violence approving attitude was the only significant risk factor for a domestic violence approving behavior. In terms of females, a weak English fluency level showed to be the highest risk for approving domestic violence, followed by their attitudes. So the study limitations was, uh, we had the small sample size, it was only 100 participants, um, but we can do a larger um, study in, uh, in the future. And the second uh, limitation was inadequate acculturation measures. Participant acculturation was inferred by the number of post resettlement years instead of group, uh, grouping participants by their identified acculturation uh, strategy. According to Barry, integration, assimilation, separation, marginalization. Uh, so the problem with Barry's model, it lacks important specifier because men usually go out more. So they're more integrated in society and, and but women are more in the separation phase because they're staying at home most of the time. So they don't interact with the main society, with the mainstream society. So our conclusions and recommendations. So years after their resettlement in the US, many Arab female refugees are still poorly acculturated due to weak English skills, unemployment, separation from mainstream society, and their domestic violence approving attitudes have not reduced much due to their poor acculturation and them staying at home most of the time. They're not mixed up with mainstream society. So their domestic violence approving behavior did not really change much. And they're afraid of being excluded by society 
and afraid of being divorced and therefore just being ostracized by society. So this suggests that policy changes need to be made to address the, this problem effectively. And the, there should be a shift from the USA criminal justice model for domestic violence to an ecological community model approach. Many refugees I interviewed, um, you know, males and females were ashamed because of the loss of status. They were engineers, doctors, lawyers. They held great positions in their home country. And they come here and they feel that they're lost. they lost their jobs. They have no jobs. They lost their status. And it leads to frustration and poor anger management. And I think also low self-esteem. So if they had uh, jobs in this home country, I think just there should be more resources, support resources for employment and um, providing like just support to find jobs really, because that will make a big shift in, um, in, this, in their attitude. And the legal problems with domestic violence will just, um, will, is not really the correct way to address it. I think it really should be shifted to a more ecological community model just to educate the refugees, to try to support them to find jobs. They're very ashamed because they have no jobs and they lost all this status in their home country. And they basically lost everything too, not just as jobs. They lost their jobs, their homes, their jewelry, their cars, their everything. And of course the jobs and of course income and money. So unfortunately they take it out onto their wife and the violence turns to the wife. So uh, provide sociocultural education to Arab refugee um, survivors and, you know, as they encounter all these stresses. So I think that's the main uh, point. And just shift refugee domestic violence policies. That's the main issue that I wanted to talk about. And just engage them, you know, the refugees to promote their health, integration, and dignity. Thank you. very much, Dr. Hamza. Um, and we have some time for questions or comments from the audience first. Um, Tala. Yeah. Thank you, Maisa. So Maisa, as you know, the Arab population is very uh, diverse, just yes. like Latinos. You know, you can't just generalize things to different uh, populations, Arab, you know, Arab populations. My question to you, is there a breakdown of how many Egyptians you had in the study? How many Yemenis? Because to my knowledge, almost all the Yemenis and Egyptians wouldn't have lived in a refugee camp for, for example. And have you looked in your research to make that distinction between different refugee communities from the Arab world? Yeah, there's definitely a breakdown. Um, I, there were, here's the figures, and this is the figure of Syria, Iraq, Lebanon, Egypt, as you can see. There's a breakdown of the countries. Uh, Lebanon, Egypt, Iraq, Syria. And I know you're correct, the Arab population is very diverse, but the refugees are not really that educated. And you know, the refugee, po the refugee Arab population is different <coughs> than the refugee population, sorry, than the other Arabs that live here. For example, you're Arab, but you're a doctor. I'm Arab, I'm a doctor, but the refugee population is different. The women, are not usually as educated as you and me, you know? So it's very different, you know, population. The refugee population, they just lack education. They're not empowered. So it's a very different population that we looked at. But of course, there is a lot of different Arabs here that, you know, are educated, that have good jobs, the women are empowered, yeah. you know, all of that. But it's just that the sample we looked at were Arab refugees. So again, can you go back to the slide? So you're saying 13 people were from Egypt or 16 to the slide before. Yeah. So it seems like 16% of your sample were This Egyptian. doesn't, oh, sorry. Oh, you're talking about country right here, right? Right. This country, part was yeah. this country, yeah. So 16% were from Egypt, but then 97% of your population lived in a refugee camp before. And to my knowledge, none of the Egyptians that I, you know, interact with have lived in camps. 
Well, there are some Iraqis that lived in camps, some Yemeni, some, uh, you know, different populations, because Egypt um, is really, like the population is really high, and some are very, very poor, and some are not. So you're probably talking about the middle class Egyptians that have money, or the higher class Egyptians that have money, but some Egyptians are very poor, and some Yemeni lost everything in the war, some Iraqi lost everything in the war, uh, some Syrians lost everything in the war, so it depends on which um, area, because the Arab population is very diverse in terms of education, economy, uh, class level, social status, you know, all these, uh, there's so many other factors. Thank you, Tal. Any other Yes, Molly. So it seems like, um, at least implicitly, when you're talking about models of acculturation, um, you were kind of implicitly, and correct, correct me if I'm wrong, but looking kind of at like acculturation as like one of the, the positive outcomes you were trying to study. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about that decision, especially because like, using a degree of acculturation as a measure of success as a, a refugee is such a contentious issue. Um, and then also just in terms of specifically with relationship to gender-based violence, I mean, rates of gender-based violence are so high in you know parts of the American population, I mean, all of the American population, to talk about it as an issue that's necessarily solved by acculturation. I wonder if, if like, what are your thoughts on that and kind of the decisions that sure. went into making that decision? Um, as you remember, when I started the presentation, I said there's a worldwide uh, problem of domestic violence. One billion women worldwide, uh, I said that in the beginning, experience domestic violence. So worldwide, it's a worldwide problem. It's not just Arabs. So I did say that in the beginning of my presentation, right? Is there, you hope that. Yeah, so it's a worldwide problem. It's not only Arabs. Unfortunately, one billion women experience domestic violence worldwide. We're just trying to address the issue of refugees when they come, they're ashamed and they're scared and they don't wanna say there's domestic violence because they think they're gonna go straight to jail in America. The men will go straight to jail. So that's what the study was about refugees. But of course, it's a worldwide problem. Every single culture, uh, Europeans, Asians, uh, Americans, uh, Arabs, you know, African-Americans, Latino, it's a worldwide problem for sure. We have uh, one comment that came from uh, the chat. Um, Professor Jihad Halabi says that researchers need to differentiate each group of the Arab population and not to lump them into one group. How can researchers take that into consideration? You cannot generalize as one group. Well, I mean, I'm a quantitative researcher primarily. Um, one way to do that in a mathematical model is to, you know, control for some of these variables. And, and what Tella was, I think, hinting at was that you would need to control for exposure in a refugee camp in addition to country of origin and time um, spent, you know, um, in, in the country. So that's one way, but with a sample size the, of yours, like, Small, you, right. yeah. So I think you have to just be very more cautious in, in the interpretations that you're making to not overly generalize your results based on the sample that you have available and point to opportunities for, for future research that yes. your study has identified some, some pathways for exploration in the future. We did actually say that we wanted to replicate the study and use 1,000 participants because I did point out that there's a limitation to the study. It was too small. Yeah. So we were hoping to get 1,000 participants. But I want to tell you something. It's very, very difficult to um, ask this question to Arab women and Arab men. It's taboo topic to talk about. No woman is going to tell you, oh, yeah, my husband beat me yesterday. Or my, no man will tell you, I beat my wife yesterday. It's a very topic taboo in Arab culture. They don't talk about it. So it's very actually hard to get people to admit that this happened in their household. Like you don't talk about that. It's a family secret. Yeah, I understand. You, know, you probably know that from yeah. your, your part of the culture. Okay. Any parting comments from anyone at this point? I have. I yeah. do have a, a question. Yes. Your study took place in several different locales, right? Yes. In the Bay Area and Sacramento. And yes, the, Sacramento they, and the metropolitan areas. Yeah, and yeah. San Francisco. Right. So. Um, 
uh, it's analogous to the question of is there di any differentiation among the different Arab communities? Is there any differentiation in those sites about the experience? Unfortunately, um, the population that we looked at were not very educated and um, that was a big difference. They're poor, they're not educated, they don't have any uh, jobs. So um, I think that's a big contributing factor to these results too. Uh, people who are more educated um, and, you know, sometimes they have better issue about domestic violence, although there are doctors that beat their wives. So, I mean, you can't generalize, but sometimes education, uh, people are less likely to, you know, commit domestic violence because they're more educated, they're more aware of women's rights and so forth. So, the, uh -huh. No, they, they were the same, the San Francisco Bay Area and the Sacramento, because the like I said, they were refugees, no jobs, no income, no education, so all these factors. They're mostly drivers, uh, cab drivers, and, you know, that was the, what we were looking at. Okay, th th thank you very much. I, um, and so I think we'll move on with the program. Thank you so much. Um, so um, the next speaker is Dr. Teresa Betancourt. She is the Salem Professor of Global Practice at Boston College School of Social Work. Uh, she leads a transdisciplinary team, understanding the trajectories of risk and resilience in children facing multiple forms of adversity. And um, she has done research in Sierra Leone, Rwanda, and the US. And she's gonna be presenting on family-based mental health promotion for Somali and um, Bhutanese refugees resettled in the US. Thank you for joining us. Wonderful to be here. Thanks for inviting me. I thought that for this particular conference, I'd just provide an update on some of the work we've been doing on family-based prevention and community-based participatory research with two communities in New England, Somali Bantu and Bhutanese. Uh, in, in so doing, uh, I'd like to just tell you a little bit about our overall research program, some of its conceptual drivers, uh, our family strengthening intervention that was co-developed with these two communities and why we see CBPR as a really powerful stance for doing this sort of work. And then I'll give you some results from a pilot that's just been published, but also a snapshot of a hybrid implementation effectiveness trial that's currently underway and slowed down by COVID and how we've had to pivot under COVID and doing this kind of research and then some potential new directions um, for research of this nature. So as I mentioned, this is not just my work, it's the work of a huge uh, team of collaborators uh, in Springfield, Massachusetts with the Bhutanese Society, Chelsea, Massachusetts, um, with actually both communities because that's where the project really started. And then now we've extended out uh, to Lewiston, Maine, and you see here some blending even of the two refugee teams, which has been really fun. Uh, so we have our team at Boston College, we're hiring. <laughs> so we've got some cool new projects. If people are uh, interested, uh, please contact me. And then our amazing implementation partners at Jewish Family Services in Springfield, Massachusetts, and Maine Immigrant and Refugee Services in Lewiston, Maine. So our research program on children in adversity is really focused on understanding uh, factors that shape processes of risk, but also resilience and the development of children and families that face adversity globally. And in doing this work, we're focused not just on a deficits model, but strengths and capacities. I liked the conversation yesterday about a Marcus and capability theory and, and the um, relationship to dignity. And the idea is to help uh, develop evidence-based interventions that close this gap between what we know about the science of early adversity, of uh, trauma and its effects on mental health and child development, and then what's really done on the ground in very low resource settings, including those in the United States. And I'm originally from Alaska and saw many ways in which in uh, cultural loss and a, a number of risk factors out there, we had very little in the way of access to high quality or evidence-based services. So it's really been a passion of mine. And so our research spans a range of settings. We've worked on the topic of uh, children in armed conflict for many years, including a now 20 year intergenerational study of war in Sierra Leone, West Africa, and many other war affected regions. Uh, we've also then began to move from our observational research to think about intervention models. So if you're gonna learn about these leverage points for risk and also for resilient outcomes, can we do anything about them in terms of intervention models? And so we started to work on the topic of family-based prevention, first in the context of households affected by HIV and AIDS in Rwanda, and more recently in Rwanda, collaborating with the government on family home visiting interventions to promote early childhood development and prevent violence. And what's exciting about this work uh, in New England is we actually 
it's mutual learning. We took a model from Africa back to an African diaspora population here in the United States and have continued to amplify that and think about uh, working with diverse uh, refugee groups, not just African diaspora. And so this is funded by the National Institutes of Minority Health and Health Disparities, and I'm gonna focus on that work today. So to give you some background, we know when it comes to refugee children and their mental health that traumatic events, separation, loss, all increased risk of mental health difficulties. If you look at outcomes like depression or PTSD, we see rates in refugee children much higher than the US population. And we also know that in the United States, children have really poor access to mental health services and it's exacerbated in refugees. And this is for a range of different reasons. Uh, we talked yesterday about uh, stigma and there's a lot of stigma about mental health and seeking services or people don't even know uh, that there are such services here in the United States. Uh, they're often overwhelmed by their own migration experiences and may not recognize the needs that their children are displaying. And they're you know, living and attending schools in low resource settings that may have limited referral networks, uh, underperforming schools, uh, limited pediatric clinic access and things uh, that really pre present barriers. And then with COVID-19, uh, there have been all sorts of additional barriers to accessing care. So a stance that we found on our team really powerful is community-based participatory research or CVPR. I like this definition from the Kellogg Foundation. Uh, it is a collaborative approach to research that equitably involves all partners in the research process and recognizes the unique strengths that each brings. It begins with a research topic of importance to the community, has the aim of combining knowledge with action and achieving social change to improve health outcomes and eliminate health disparities. So it's a lofty goal. I can't say we always achieve it, but we're always somewhere on the CBPR spectrum, just about anywhere we work in the world. Uh, so I wanna talk a little bit about the two communities uh, where we've been collaborating first, the Somali Bantu. So the Somali Bantu are a subset within the overall Somali uh, population of war affected individuals who've been displaced. Uh, the Bantu peoples are originally taken from other parts of Africa. I had a history of slavery in Somalia. And then when the war broke out in the 90s, the civil war, you had massive displacement of you know, the Somali majority and the Somali Bantu peoples, and oftentimes into these large refugee camps in Dadaab and, and Kakuma in Kenya. And even within those camps, the Somali Bantu were in the more fragile, uh, prone to violence areas that were much more insecure, had no access to Kenyan society, citizens, citizenship status, limited access to education. And so already there was fragility. And Somalis overall are the largest single group of resettled African refugees in US history. And then in 2004, under the Obama administration, you started to see the resettlement of the Somali Bantu people. And there were over 13,000 Somali Bantu resettled in 50 communities across 38 states. <coughs> and in Boston, it began with just a few families and then pretty soon it was 400. And there's been a lot of secondary, secondary migration to Maine and other places where housing is affordable, more jobs, um, more community, sort of networks that people really value. Now, the idea of this intervention was, can we have a core intervention that can adapt and flex because we know that the dynamics of refugee resettlement is they are ever changing. So if we highly refine things just for one cultural group, then when other new cultural groups arrive, we might not be able to accommodate. And so early on in the project, we started to think, well, if we start to co-develop this model, could we do it with another refugee community where there's some shared experience of the refugee uh, you know, parent, but also uh, a different culture, a different language? And so we got to know the Bhutanese refugees through a community gardens project in Chelsea when the, when the project first started, and they've become our second partner in the work. And people talk about Bhutan as the happiest kingdom on earth. You've probably heard that. Not so for the Nepali ethnic origin people, the Latamsa people who were uh, targeted by ethnic cleansing campaigns in the 90s, uh, which eliminated their citizenship rights. They lost property <laughs> rights and were displaced to refugee camps in Nepal. And like the Somali Bantu spent uh, over 20 years, you know, generations growing up in those camps. Similarly, uh, very limited access to work, to education and living in very insecure situations and camps. So Bhutanese refugees in the United States uh, began to resettle here uh, in 2007, and there were nearly 100,000 Bhutanese resettled. And a very important uh, aspect of the Bhutanese resettlement has been this very high rate of suicide. And this actually was the subject of a, a Centers for Disease Control report trying to understand what was going on. And we see that the suicide rate in the Bhutanese is almost twice the US national average. 
And some of the research that's been done indicates that suicide may be connected with experiences of separation, integration uh, difficulties, perceived lack of social support. So mental health issues are right there at the forefront. So the project actually began, as I mentioned, with the Somali Bantu, and this is back in 2004, 2005, when we were contacted by the Lynn Public School District uh, just outside of Boston. And they had a lot of uh, young uh, Somali Bantu children coming into the school district. And there were complaints from the teachers. These kids are shoving and pushing, they're badly behaved. And then we have these parent-teacher nights and the parents aren't coming, these are disengaged parents. And so we went out and met with community leaders and started to talk with them about what might be going on. And as you can imagine, shoving, pushing to the front of the line to get things in a refugee camp is a survival skill. But now when it's art supplies in the classroom, it's a very different dynamic. And so there were just misunderstandings. The behavior was being labeled as you know, problematic or even pathologized when it was a learned survival skill. And then we also learned that for the parents to turn your children over to the teachers to be raised well is very respectful. So them not coming to parent teacher night and not being so, you know, on the backs of the teachers was actually their view of being respectful, but it was misunderstood. So we did awareness raising, we met community liaisons and Awais Hussein, uh, who was one of our early partners, he and I wrote a seed grant to start to work together to understand some of the community needs and then think about, could we start doing some preventative interventions? And this has sort of grown over the years. This has been going on since 2005. So there's very little use of CBPR in mental health research, especially with refugees, but it's a really promising approach given these issues of stigma around mental health. And in using especially community-based research or that starts with qualitative work, you can start to learn non-stigmatizing terms for communicating about mental health needs in children. But you can also learn about strengths that can be the active ingredients for intervention models. And this sort of virtuous cycle of a shared vision, a collaborative approach uh, can have many different spin-offs too. With our assessment work, we were able to do a lot of advocacy in the communities. So the CBPR approach that we've really focused on, we would call it for refugees by refugees. We hire community health workers from the community and research assistants from the communities. We're training them to do data collection. And also when we think about intervention models, we're training non-specialists, which is why you've, asked, you've seen me ask a lot of questions about community health workers, state by state, and what are the policies for them to deliver an evidence-based service, especially behavioral health. And so when we start working in a community, we often are hosting outreach events, letting people know about the project so that uh, it's not surprising when you're contacted to ask if you wanna be in the study. We do a lot of awareness raising on topics that we might learn about along the way. And then we've set up community advisory boards in both communities. So we have an adult and a youth board, both in the Somali Bantu and the Bhutanese communities. And they've been with us every step of the process. <laughs> So I mentioned qualitative work. I would say our research is very much mixed <laughs> methods that we're, we very much value starting with the qualitative work from the ground up. How do people around here even think of things related to mental health and children? What are non-stigmatizing ways to talk about this? But also what are protective processes that help children do well despite challenges? And then we're using that data to select, adapt, or create our mental health measures, but also to inform our intervention models, we're validating measures wherever we can, and then coming back to implement the intervention using the most rigorous designs possible, including randomized control trials, implementation science models. So I mentioned implementation science, and this is really something our lab does a lot of work on, uh, especially when you're going to be doing services research or thinking about scaling, you have to design for implementation. And very early on in intervention development, think about questions such as, well, who's going to deliver this? What will be the platform for reaching people? What's its fit to the ultimate service population, acceptability, feasibility in doing these sorts of models? And then lately we've been explicitly testing strategies for quality improvement and for scaling and thinking about sustainment, which also means who's gonna pay for this uh, and coming from what resources? And then factors that mediate or moderate the impact as well as quality. And oftentimes in implementation science, this may mean hybrid design. So the, the bigger trial that's an R01 is a hybrid type two. So it's implementation and effectiveness being tested at once. So if you're interested in any of the details on terminology, uh, this is a publication from the American Journal of Public Health that our teams did together that talk about child mental health uh, terminology in the two communities. And then I wanted to talk a little bit about the intervention model. Uh, importantly, it comes from a widely accepted evidence-based practice called Family Talk, was developed by Dr. Bill Beardsley. 
He designed it from the beginning to be delivered by a wide range of providers. It's been used in Native American communities, Costa Rica, so it already had some flexibility culturally, but it's a family-based preventative model. And Bill's work was originally for the prevention of depression and the offspring of depressed caregivers. And so we adapted it to first the HIV and AIDS, to think about living well despite that adversity, and then to the refugee experience of families, flourishing, thriving, despite all of these changes in your life, especially coming to the United States. And so uh, again, this is one of those ideas of mutual learning. We're taking that intervention back here to the United States. And so core components of the FSIR, as we call it, you've got the refugee family affected by past war trauma, loss, resettlement stressors, and then these risk factors that we learned about in our formative work, limited access to services overall, misunderstanding or misinformation about systems in the US, the educational system, social services, poor family communication, just not talking, you know, especially as kids get older, not having a lot of knowledge about what's going on in their life or what it's like for them at school and then intergenerational conflict. Uh, and we've seen even in the Somali Bantu families, sometimes the mother still speaks Mai Mai, but the kids been in school for several years, they're only speaking English and they can barely have conversations together. So the core intervention components are navigating formal and informal supports. So the formal systems, but also you have a home visitor from your community and they're helping you think about how do you problem solve within the people around here, your neighbors, the members of your community. Psychoeducation about the US educational system. How do you read a report card? What's an IEP? What are the, they expect at parent teacher conferences? And a big part of this, and I think this also relates to uh, the topic of the conference on dignity is the narrative piece of the intervention. And that's the family story. And it's meant to be a strengths narrative where we really talk about the journey the family has been on from the perspective of the parents, but also from the children. And then we move uh, also towards a joint narrative for the family, where they hope to go in their futures. And that's really looking in a forward way together. And then also a very important part of these models are developing parenting skills, just about routines, positive reinforcement, reducing use of harsh punishment. So that relates to the prior uh, conversation on violence. And the idea is to improve the parent-child relationship and diminish the risk of mental health problems in children. So there are 10 modules. I won't go into all the detail. I've sort of told you about its strengths-based orientation. The protective resources we learned in our formative work are very important as active ingredients for promoting mental health in kids. And there's a manualized protocol. It's weekly meetings between the home visitor who comes from the community, speaks the language, and they have separate sessions at first with the adults assessing uh, the family situation and strengths. And then from the perspective of children, both um, talking about the family narrative. And then two major components uh, are telling that story. And I'll show you a, a picture of one and then the family meeting, which is coming together to talk about what have been the challenges everyone's facing, how they've addressed them, and where they want to go as a family. And these family meetings are practices a lot of families go on to continue. So here's one Bhutanese um, family's example of their narrative. And the idea of the home visitor is not to retell horrible traumatic events, but really to talk about when you went through those times, what were the things that got you through? What are the unique strengths about you and your family that you've realized? And to really focus on those for intervention uh, discussions. So I'm gonna show you briefly uh, a recently uh, published uh, set of results from our pilot, which involved 80 families. So talk about small sample size, but a lot of individuals. And they all had a school aged child, seven to 17. And this was done both in Springfield, Massachusetts, as well as Lewiston, Maine. Uh, we published this in the Journal of Adolescent Health if you're interested in, in some of the results. And so you see randomization. Um, we assessed families um, at two time points. So you had half the sample in the family strengthening intervention, half just getting the usual social services. And uh, we used the CABs at every stage to talk about how you talk about randomization in the community. Uh, if we hit barriers to implementation to get feedback from the CAB. And then we were refining the intervention as we go. Uh, so you see here some of the results, and this is a teeny sample, um, but we did see pre to post a reduction in traumatic stress reactions as reported by children. Uh, caregivers reporting fewer depression symptoms in their kids. Conduct problem, uh, you know, sort of went both ways. For the Bhutanese, they improved. For the Somali Bantu, less so. In fact, we saw better rates uh, in the care as usual group. Uh, so that's got to be examined in a bigger sample for sure. But we did see in the Bhutanese families reduced family arguing very high rates of feasibility and acceptability when you ask people about being in the intervention. So the next uh, phase, as I mentioned, is a hybrid trial, a bigger sample size, 
uh, three time points, pre, post, and six months follow up uh, with all of the participatory processes. But what we're also now testing are strategies for quality improvement. So we have two different agency configurations. We have one agency where we're taking their existing community health workers, they do other things. And so we're also on the top of that, having them do this home visiting intervention. And then with the other agency in Maine, we're having staff hired just dedicated to the intervention. And you can learn things about how does that go for uh, supervision and quality improvement. And Greg Ahrens, who's here at UCSD, who I'll see later today, uh, has been a big influence on our work. Uh, his EPIS model of implementation science has been extremely valuable where we're looking at all the different stages of intervention development from exploration of fit to preparation <laughs> for implementation, actual implementation processes, and then thinking about sustainment. And in doing this, we have to consider uh, the outer context characteristics, such as uh, the ecosystem of the services environment, uh, the targeted um, different agencies that are out there, the financing mechanisms, and then the inner context, such as the agency level factors like leadership, organizational characteristics, the, um, the intervention itself and its uh, different characteristics, and then bridging factors like community academic partnerships. We also use plan, do, study, act cycles, which come from implementation science. So as we're implementing, if we find uh, a challenge, we come up with a plan uh, to address it. We implement that plan and then we study how that, tar that targeted plan affected the barrier or not. Uh, and uh, this can then be passed on across sites. And it's a quality improvement cycle that's been uh, very useful under COVID-19. You can imagine there were all sorts of challenges with remote access, uh, Somali Bantu, sometimes you have multiple households that were combining in different ways, a lot of disability and alcohol problems in the Bhutanese that weren't well addressed with the services environment. Fidelity monitoring is another part of implementation science that's so important. <laughs> if we're going to train lay specialists, non-specialists to do this intervention, we must ensure that it's high quality and we do no harm. And we actually uh, think it's adequate that a home visitor from the community can deliver the evidence-based intervention. And so one thing we did, um, you've got your usual training and supervision, but because we had a seed team of experts who were from the culture spoke the language, we actually got permission from families for the home visitor to say, look, I'm new to this, I'm learning it. With your permission, I'd like to record myself doing the intervention. And then my supervisor who speaks my language is from our culture is gonna give me feedback on how I'm doing. And in that way we could improve the practice. And recording is always a sensitive in refugee communities, but because it was orientated uh, towards improving practice, it actually was uh, pretty acceptable. And then a lot of weekly group supervision at both levels. So I'm not gonna be able, because of uh, limited time to go into a lot of detail, we're midway in this trial anyway, but you can see we've got a much bigger sample size um, in Bhutanese families and Somali Bantu, but very big differences in household size, Somali Bantu 6.9 family members on average, Bhutanese 4.7. And uh, citizenship, we talked about that and how that can contribute to anxiety and other mental health problems. Very low in the Bhutanese community, only 10%, whereas 89% of the Somali Bantu have citizenship and very low access, 53% of Bhutanese don't, haven't had access to education, 31% of the Somali Bantu community, and that's a lot of the females, as well as very limited English uh, in both communities and much more um, on the Bhutanese side, or sorry, on the Somali Bantu side. So I'm gonna just um, show you a little bit of qual process data before I wrap up. Uh, we did exit interviews in the pilot with people who'd gone through the intervention as well as the providers. And when it came to acceptability and feasibility, we saw you know, the flexibility of scheduling being so important. That's what home visiting can do instead of expecting people to show to a clinic. Uh, but this uh, family narrative really needs a lot of attention and training and supervision so that uh, people do it uh, in a way that focuses on the strengths. And so you see here this 12 year old Somali girl, my favorite part was when we talked about my grandparents and stuff. My mom never talked about them before. I like to know about them. <laughs> but the Somali Bantu mother, I didn't feel comfortable in talking about what happened in the past in Somalia and the refugee camp. Life wasn't easy for me and my family. Uh, and then, you know, another very important part of acceptability was having an interventionist who knows the culture and speaks the language. And so as a Somali Bantu mother said, I don't see anyone else in the community that would be able to do that job. We understand each other. Impact on participants, uh, family uh, communication improved, spending time together as a family was a very important outcome for a lot of families. They just hadn't really problem solved on that. 
and also relationships between caregivers, we saw improvements. And so this Bhutanese mother talks about, we learned that we should not avoid children. Now we understand that we should talk to each other, ask about how the other person is doing, who he's with, where he's going. We still share things between mother and son. We now know what's happening in each other's lives. Or this Somali Bantu girl, just to talk with my family was the best. I never talked with my parents like that. Now, when it comes to improving the intervention, as you can imagine, when you talk to communities, they say, we need tangible skills too. Thanks for the home visiting, it's helpful, we do appreciate it, but we need actual help like services like English classes, a youth group for girls and boys, parent groups, money saving programs, or as this uh, Bhutanese boy said, group services like a women's group, men's group, youth groups, couples groups to help all members in the community. So there was a real desire to move not just from the family focus, but to the broader community focus. And that's the importance of the embeddedness within agencies. Uh, so I'm almost out of time, so uh, I won't be able to go into great detail about all of the COVID-19 dynamics we experienced in trying to do this trial. Uh, but we did add items in the assessment on the impact of COVID-19. Hopefully we'll be able to present those in the future. We adapted one of the modules on health promotion to talk about the challenges of uh, navigating under COVID-19, both for mental and physical well-being and health promotion. So we did some community outreach events and each community has different platforms. Facebook Live is used by the Bhutanese, not so the Somali Bantu, that's WhatsApp. So we did those sort of psycho eds on different platforms. And then the digital actually was something we thought a lot about under COVID-19. Uh, it became really hard to do a home visit over the phone, especially when you've got 6.9 kids on average running around. And so uh, we had to think about how can we engage families if no one can go to the house? And so we had already had um, some funding from Boston College working with computer science and the vice provost for design and innovation to develop uh, digital tools for the home visitor. So the app is digital. And the idea is if you wanna be nimble and change to new cultures like the Iraqi and the Congolese, if you have a digital app for the manual, you can change that material quite rapidly. So then we started working on a family facing app. So a tablet could be at the household, they could gather around if the home visitor couldn't be there. And that's underway. It's a co-design process that we've been working on. Uh, but I would like to say that there are also new opportunities to think about nimbleness because we have real uh, exciting and important um, and uh, perilous moments in US refugee history underway right now. We have to think about doing well, especially with the Afghan resettlement. And so we've been in discussion with the Office of Refugee Resettlement. Could it ever be possible to think about prevention? family-based prevention, but that's, you know, that's lay workers who are already out here, California being one of the big sites where that could be possible. So watch this space. I don't know if we'll be able um, to go there, but that's really some of our hope. So in conclusion, uh, I hope I've been able to convince you that CBPR is a powerful approach to work with refugee communities to promote dignity, hope, and good science and that family-based prevention really deserves much more attention when we talk about mental health of kids and families. Collaborative research and community engagement is critical to strong implementation, but also innovation. That's how you come up with the best ideas and you learn from you know, having to innovate. And there's mutual <laughs> learning from very low, low resource settings that can be very valuable here in the United States. And then you know, when we're designing in interventions, think about scale and implementation science. What's it going to take uh, to get to greater reach, access and sustainment and quality? And that uh, has a huge role to play in extending evidence-based services of all different types. So with that, I'll wrap up and thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Betancourt. Um, we have a lot of people that want to get into the discussion, which is great. I think it's really a very hopeful note to be able to go beyond um, the description of, of issues and context and trauma to some intervention research. And so I think that it's a good place to start. So we have one question from the room and then we have a couple of people who want to ask questions live. So we'll go back to the chat. So um, go ahead. Yeah, thank you so much. There's so many levels on which this is interesting and a million questions I'd like to ask, but just to go with one for now. Um, I was curious, you know, it's always exciting to see CBPR and like you said, it's really complicated to sort of fully implement that. And I was curious if there were sort of particular places at which communities did help shape the research questions or sort of what was the, what were the interests um, coming out of the community in terms of this research and all the different stages? Yeah, no, it's a really important question because it's constant negotiation and you're coming, you know, with your positionality and your interest and then communities are coming with what they're facing. And so 
I guess what's nice about CDPR and this kind of work is that there are different phases where data is generated that everyone can use. Everyone kind of owns the data. And so that first American Journal of Public Health uh, paper, which really to talk about mental health and kids, we don't use that word. So we start with these free list exercises. What are the problems of kids or you can say refugee kids if that's what you're trying to get more specificity around here. And you just let all the problems come and you tally them. And what was great about that is then we got a list, you know, and sort of priority areas from the perspective of adults and children by the two communities of topics of great importance. And so everyone could then own that data. And so in terms of, you know, we had joined together around mental health because of the small band to behavioral, you know, complaints in the schools. So the mental health, that sort of shared topic was of interest. Um, and for the Bhutanese, the high suicide rate. So, you know, that helped to shape that research question. But what was neat about those community tallies is there were so many other things like lack of um, moral guidance or a madrasa in Chelsea, uh, where people wanted to advocate for that and, and beginning to um, think about with the Bhutanese um, unmet needs around problem drinking or bullying in school. And now they could go and we actually had an event at City Hall in Chelsea where we distributed those findings. We had a report, we had the mayor come and we talked about the city of Chelsea and the needs of refugee uh, communities and the refugee staff uh, were the ones presenting. And so I think what's nice about CBPR, if you take that stance of everyone has a role to play, has a stake in this and has access to these data and you're using those sorts of data analytic techniques that are pretty simple, like a tally, you know, done by community members. There's a lot of rich data that's generated and can be useful. Another thing that spun off was a girls group um, out in Chelsea, uh, where the girls were just saying, we don't have anyone in our community who's gone to college and we need a space after school to take our academics seriously. And now we just had a guest speaker last year, Hawa, who was one of our girls group participants when she was young. And now she went full ride to Brandeis. That was amazing for us. Mm -hmm. So, you know, those kind of, I think if you do CBPR in this way, you can have spin off projects that everybody feels really invested in. Super. Okay, we've got a question from Dr. Peter Ventivogel, um, who can turn on his camera. Yes. Hi. Hi. Thank you, Theresa. Which is uh, thank you for the great oh, presentation. Oh, maybe we can't and hear your voice yet. Hang on. Um, oh, you cannot hear me. Okay. Um, can you try speaking? We'll see if we can hear you. Attendees can yeah, hear. Yeah, can you hear me? Oh, now? we can't. Okay, go ahead then. We can't in the room, but attendees. Oh, can hear attendees online. can hear, but we can't hear in the room. So yeah, maybe I'm going to oh. have to read your question then. Um, yes, so, that's fine. Uh, because otherwise, um, the speaker won't be able to hear you. So he says, "Great work of of the group of Dr. Betancourt with an exemplary qualitative and quantitative research and active involvement model of working with." Uh, non-specialists to deliver mental health interventions is well established in lower and middle income countries, but is often more difficult to realize in higher income countries with restrictions. How did you navigate those barriers? Well, it's nice to see you, Peter. Uh, it's been a while since we've been able to all see anyone in person. Uh, I, I can't say, that's why I keep asking these questions about community health workers. I can't say we have successfully found sustainment and the mechanism beyond one-off project funds, or even um, in talking to ORR about what will happen for the Afghan resettlement, you know, there's likely to be a bolus of money around mental health, but then will it be a billable service under state Medicaid expansion once that bolus is over? Mm -hmm. And, you know, a lot of our conversations are about how can we be more creative here, use this emergency as a window of opportunity for innovation to really take prevention seriously. We don't need to uh, do a lot of assessment to know that these families are highly traumatized and the kids have had acute trauma and the parents have had acute trauma. So it would seem to me there's justification already for evidence-based prevention work. Yeah. Uh, so I, I think it's such an important question for all of us to be thinking about. I can't say that we've entirely overcome it, but we're in there fighting the good fight. Got it. Um, I know Dr. Seth Hanna wants to ask a question live. Are we going to have the same problem? Will he be, will be able to can, hear him? Can you hear me? Uh, let's let's try. Um, Dr. Hannah, can yes. you turn? Um, hi there. Hi. Can you try speaking? Yeah, I'm talking now. Can you oh, hear me? Oh no, we can't hear you anyway. Okay, here I'll I'm paste sorry it. about I'll that. Paste Could you put your question in the chat, and and we'll go to the next question, and we'll come back to you, and then we have Dr. Shortosh. So the Dr. Waters has asked a question in the chat. I'm going to read it. 
He says, I can see interesting links to the refugee well school studies in Europe. Can you say a little bit more about consulting with communities, members and stakeholders in interpreting the results and pointing to future horizons for the program? Yeah, no, and I really was excited to see Dr. Waters' presentation yesterday because I saw the implementation elements of it and found that really exciting. Uh, I would say the way to do consultation with stakeholders is constant engagement from the very beginning and then circling back uh, so that you have a ready audience for your findings. Uh, that's easier in some places than not. And then sometimes I think for us with the refugee communities, if we go as partners together to big stakeholders like, you know, Medicaid, <laughs> you know, state level Medicaid uh, leaders or school leaders, it's more powerful. Uh, so I would say engage early, engage constantly, iterate and circle back and um, build coalitions. And I would say, you know, in some of our work, you know, we're doing this with much more success in certain places like Rwanda, where we're actually scaling up now to 10,000 households, that family home visiting intervention for early childhood and violence prevention. Uh, I think in Rwanda, you know, what's nice about our implementation science is we are actually explicitly testing a multi-level strategy for buy-in called the Play Collaborative. And in the Play Collaborative, we have meetings, you know, at the national level, at the district, at the sector, at the cell and village level about doing this intervention. And that's a real explicit strategy for buy-in. We haven't with this refugee project had the resources mm -hmm. to do that kind of work, but I think those kind of models are very powerful. Excellent. Okay, so Dr. Hanna has his question in the chat. I apologize, but I'm gonna read it for him. Um, I have a question about the implementation aspect of your presentation. How did you define usual care? How did you implement your intervention alongside existing programming? How clean was the separation between the two groups? Yeah, it would say it's a challenge because usual care is in the United States is a lot of different things. And it wouldn't be ethical to say we're gonna have a no care group. Uh, so to layer in family strengthening on top of usual care, then you're looking at trying to isolate the effects of the additional family strengthening. But because the home visitor is a navigator and helping people explicitly navigate formal and informal services, you're, you're creating messiness because the home visitor will actually identify depression or PTSD in someone in the family and make that referral and make sure that they get to appointments. Uh, so I think this allows for greater uh, sort of generalization. It's not a tightly controlled, you know, laboratory experiment. We're in the real world and that's the nature of implementation science research. Mm -hmm. Okay, and our parting uh, conclusion uh, question, comments to Dr. Shardash. Thank you. Uh, Teresa, this is a very uh, amazing and complex uh, project. And in one sense, it's a mental health intervention. In another sense, it's a research uh, enterprise. In yet another sense, it's uh, imparting skills to people. And in yet a fourth sense, it's um, a means of acculturation. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm wondering to what extent you, you think of these multiple things as happening all, all together, and in, in particular, uh, to what extent are you um, cognizant of the acculturation aspect of it? And to what extent are the, the people in the Bhutanese and Somali Bantu um, communities cognizant that it's an acculturation, um, the means of acculturation or access to ways to become American? So um, are, are you cognizant of, you know, we are making people American as one of the things we're doing this. And are the people who you're working with cognizant of, oh, look at all this stuff. This is a good way for me to become an American, to take advantage of these. Hmm. Yeah, I wouldn't say that's an explicit orientation sometimes. And I think Morgan did a good job in raising some criticisms of acculturation as a concept, you know, this idea that the dominant thing is to be American and we want to move towards it. And if then you become more American, you're more successful or resilient. I, I think I'm not sure if that would gel with how our communities think about um, success or identity or meaning making. Uh, I think 
you know, I've had these conversations with Arthur Kleinman actually, who uh, said, you know, as a, as a construct, acculturation is dead. <laughs> you know, it's highly problematic. Um, and and so I, I think there's tensions there in the field. I would say that the orientation we take is we want people to flourish and we want them to make meaning and we want them to be successful and you know successful in the united states i don't think we're defining as being more american but you know getting you know through school and doing well and going on to college that to us i guess you could define that as acculturation but i i think we also see it as um flourishing rather than putting the american sort of lens on this and i think you you know we we do the same model in rwanda you know and in rwanda it's about living well despite the adversity of extreme poverty or living well despite the adversity of hiv and aids in your household um so i would i would frame it more i i don't think any of us really talk about being american or culturation as the frame it's more about um flourishing and helping unleash people's potential um to do you know to achieve the best things they can as a family and as kids and are the refugees thinking about it that way too? I mean, are they adopting the flourishing framework for it? Or, yeah, or are they... but yeah, I would say, yeah, definitely it's not a conversation about being more American. In fact, like doing well means not losing your culture. And I couldn't show you all the rich data, but for <clears> these parents, they're really stressed that their kids would lose their identity and culture um, by being here in the United States. So they want a way to honor that and maintain it and own it and some of the nice quotes that i had to cut are about for the the kids saying i want to learn the nepali language you know when you do those bigger things i want a place where we can yeah. learn our traditional dances and and we would see that as flourishing you know hanging on to your culture as you also carve a new identity in the U.S.